On the 22nd of June 1941, Nazi Germany and her allies would invade the Soviet Union in what would be the largest military operation in human history. The Axis forces took the Soviets by surprise, violating the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, routing their defences and capturing millions of Red Army prisoners in a short period of time. As the Nazis got further into the Soviet Union, they met increasing resistance, and supply and logistics problems began to take a toll on the invading forces. What Hitler expected would take several weeks soon turned into a bloody struggle that lasted several months and would eventually continue for many years. This video examines Operation Barbarossa in great detail, including preliminary preparations, what led to early success, and why it ultimately failed. The Red Forces were ravaged by Stalin's purges beginning in 1937, which saw roughly 34,000 out of 75 to 80,000 officers exiled, arrested, or executed, with the one consistency amongst them being that they didn't owe their careers to Stalin and might subvert his authority. One of those victims, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, was instrumental in forming the theory of deep battle, which suggested that defeating large armies in one swift battle would be impossible, and that smaller engagements where penetrations were made into the enemy's rear in the context of a broader war was the way forward. Although a conflict between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany seemed inevitable, owing to Hitler's anti-Bolshevik rhetoric, the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact shook the world, in particular socialists around the world, many of whom saw it as a pact with the devil. From Stalin's perspective, he had desired an alliance with Britain and France to curb Nazi aggression, but their appeasement made him feel that their leaders would willfully sacrifice the USSR to satisfy Hitler. Negotiations with the British, French and Polish made Stalin think he would achieve more for his territorial ambitions if he negotiated directly with Hitler, and so he did. The pact would divide Eastern Europe into spheres of influence, with Stalin gaining access to the Baltic states, Eastern Poland and a slice of Romania. The success of the Nazi invasion into Poland took the Soviets by surprise, who believed the Poles would hold out for months, forcing Stalin to scramble forces to claim eastern Poland and provide a buffer zone for the inevitable German invasion. Stalin also thought that the German conflict with the Western Allies would result in a prolonged stalemate, giving the Soviets years to shore up their defences. Hitler's swift victories in the West dashed any hopes of that, however. The short preparation period for Poland saw Soviet forces struggle against a Polish army barely holding itself together, and they would similarly suffer in Finland. Finland especially was a complete disaster, and helped further convince the Germans of the Soviets' incompetence. From the conclusion of the Winter War, the Red Army underwent reforms which undid many of the effects of Stalin's earlier purges. Conventional general officer ranks were reintroduced, political commissars were subjected to subordinate roles once again. Voroshilov, a Stalinist yes-man, was demoted to a symbolic role as a deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers, replaced by Semyon Timoshenko as defense commissar. Policies used to restrict the formation of armored divisions after the Kulik Commission were also reversed. Although this helped the Red Army recover militarily from the purges, the Red Army now had three chiefs of general staff, Shaposhnikov, Meritskov, and Zhukov. By June 1941, 75% of all officers had only been in their positions for less than a year. While anti-armor reforms were rolled back, Stalin still aligned with conservative officers, so while the armor corps was the largest in the army, they lacked much of the training, equipment, and logistical support necessary to bring them to maturity. The Soviets anticipated a German attack, but were not completely sure upon which axis it would fall. The Pripyat marshes essentially divided the Eastern Front into two, the North through Belarus, or South into Ukraine. In 1938, Marshal Boris Shaposhnikov postulated defense across both axes. In July 1940, it was prioritized along the northern axis. Again in October 1940, with Stalin fearful of the Nazis seizing the vital food source of Ukraine, the plan was altered to prioritize the southern front. War games in January 1941 were designed to validate these plans, and Soviet diplomats believed that peace reigned supreme in spite of intelligence detecting German mobilization. This dichotomy between Stalin's frantic desire for peace and desire to prepare for war helped pave the way for the Red Army's catastrophic performance during Barbarossa. Even in the event of suspicious German army activities, Zhukov writes in his memoirs Stalin's reaction, quote, I remember well Stalin's response to a briefing on suspicious activities of the German troops. Hitler and his generals are not such fools to fight on two fronts at the same time, which was what broke their neck in World War I. Hitler would not have the strength to fight on two fronts, and Hitler would not attempt such a risky adventure. Between the 26th of April and 10th of May, forces from the Transbaikal, Ural, Siberian districts and Far Eastern Front were sent to border areas. On May 13th, 28 rifle divisions, 4 field army headquarters and 3 armies, the 20th, 24th and 28th began to assemble. 
However, only the 20th had assembled west of Moscow. The other two hadn't moved. In spite of these measures, the Soviets were still desperately unprepared for a German invasion, clouded still in the delusion of peace, and would suffer the consequences. German triumph thus far had intensified their desire to invade the Soviet Union. Germany was at a severe trade deficit with the Soviets according to the trade agreement outlined in Molotov-Ribbentrop and codified in the German-Soviet Commercial Agreement in 1940. The German leadership were irritated by the fact that they couldn't dictate the terms of the trade agreement and were obsessed by the desire to extract resources from land they controlled. Nazi racial ideology, which viewed Slavs as subhuman and the Soviet Union as a bastion of Judeo-Bolshevism, were major factors motivating the Nazi desire to even consider the USSR as an enemy in the first place. German offensive doctrine centered around the idea of rapid penetration and exploitation, chiefly performed by mechanized divisions. The emphasis on the offensive meant that German defensive doctrine had not radically changed from 1918, which involved defense in depth. This defensive doctrine rested on three chief assumptions. Firstly, that there were sufficient German reserves to establish a defense in depth. Secondly, that the enemy attack was chiefly done by dismounted infantry. And finally, that German commanders would be able to freely select their positions and conduct a flexible defense. None of these assumptions would apply to the Soviet theater. Other German disadvantages included only 321,000 reservists, compared to 14 million Soviet reservists when Barbarossa began. Furthermore, as David Glantz described in his book When Titans Clashed, the Nazis adopted an approach of robbing Peter to pay Paul, mobilizing industrial workers for military operations, and then demobilizing some to return to industry. Hitler and the Nazi leadership thus banked on a short struggle rather than a protracted war. German motorized divisions also ran on large amounts of captured vehicles, such as the Czech 38T tanks and French trucks. A consequence of this was that it would be very difficult to procure the parts necessary to repair these vehicles when they inevitably broke down, and also lacked the manuals and tools to even know how to repair them in the first place. German attitudes on the Soviet Union centered around racial lines, which also believed that they would fall like a house of cards upon invasion, emboldening the Nazis with the confidence they had no right to have. Hitler began amassing a force of 152 divisions, including 19 panzer and 14 motorized divisions. This included 3,350 tanks, 600,000 vehicles, 600,000 horses, 7,146 artillery pieces and 2,770 aircraft. Manpower consisted of 3 million Germans and 650,000 non-German Axis forces. These forces were divided into the Army of Norway in the north and Army Groups North, Senna and South. The Soviets had roughly 171 divisions, numbering 2.6 to 2.9 million men in the border regions. Stalin made the mistake of concentrating the bulk of the initial defense forces in three defensive belts along the frontier, 57, 52, and 62 in belts 1, 2, and 3 respectively. The Red Army was caught with its figurative pants down. Its defense concentrated on the southern axis near Ukraine, while the Germans concentrated their mechanized forces on the northern approach, leaving them off balance. Stalin continued to be willfully ignorant. However, he was somewhat justified as many intelligence reports he had received predicting an earlier German invasion had turned out to be false, and German deception made it even more difficult to predict which reports were true or not. Stalin bears a lot of responsibility for the horrific defeat the Red Army was about to incur, but as David Glantz points out, the issues existed on a much deeper level, writing that, quote, In retrospect, the most serious Soviet failure was neither strategic nor tactical surprise, but institutional surprise. In June 1941, the Red Army and Air Force were in transition, changing their organization, leadership, equipment, training, troop dispositions, and defensive plans. Had Hitler attacked four years earlier or even one year later, the Soviet armed forces would have been more than a match for the Wehrmacht. Whether by coincidence or instinct, however, the German dictator struck at a time when his own armed forces were still close to their peak and his arch enemy was most vulnerable. It was this institutional surprise that was most responsible for the catastrophic Soviet defeats of 1941. Thus, the two forces stood opposite one another along the Soviet-Polish border, with German forces reaching their jumping-off points as the 22nd of June approached, and the largest military offensive in human history, with catastrophic consequences for the human race, was about to begin. The warnings of a German invasion fell on deaf ears. Local commanders were noticing suspicious German movements at the border and passing them up the chain of command. A German deserter, Alfred Luskov, also a dedicated communist, had swum across the Bug River on the afternoon of the 21st to warn Soviet border guards that German soldiers were at their jumping off points in preparation for an attack the following morning. 
Zhukov, Stalin and Timoshenko met regarding this news, and despite Timoshenko advising Stalin that troops should be placed on high alert, Stalin hesitated, stating that, quote, it's too early to issue such a directive. Perhaps the question can be settled peacefully. At approximately 0300 hours on the 22nd, 30 Luftwaffe bombers crossed the Soviet border, attacking 10 major air bases at 0315 hours. A roaring artillery barrage blasted the Soviet front line, signaling the beginning of the ground war, and when the sun rose, another 500 bombers, 270 dive bombers, and 480 fighters struck 66 airfields and forward areas. Although Soviet border guards were placed on high alert at 1am, calling on them to remain ready but avoid provocative actions, many units did not receive the order at all and were taken by complete surprise. These air attacks claimed 1200 Soviet planes, many of which were still sitting idle on runways and airfields. Some border posts were overrun with little effort, while others saw vicious fighting, with Soviet soldiers fighting till they ran out of ammunition. Soviet command and control totally collapsed, with communications infrastructure being totally overwhelmed by the initial reports of German attack. These issues were compounded by German Brandenburger Special Forces soldiers parachuting behind red lines, wearing their uniforms and cutting telephone lines, seizing bridges and sowing chaos. The situation at the front line was far worse, with the Soviet command ordering counterattacks its units could not possibly conduct, such as Stalin and Timoshenko's Directive No. 3 calling for a general counteroffensive. Across both axes of attack, the Nazis achieved remarkable success, but in many cases Soviet forces held on doggedly despite their hopeless situation. In one example on the 24th, Major General Solyankin ordered KV-1 and KV-2 heavy tanks to halt the 6th Panzer Division at Reseniai over the Debusa River. However, his tanks had not been boresighted and received orders that simply instructed them to ram the German tanks. Even so, the Germans encountered difficulties dealing with them. During the first week of the war, almost all of the Soviet's mechanized corps lost 90% of their tanks. The Soviet Air Force commander in Leningrad, Major General Alexander Novikov, sent 263 bombers and 224 fighters to attack German positions in Finland, and although taking them by surprise, failed to inflict a decisive victory owing to poor intelligence. Back on the ground, Army Group Center's 2nd and 3rd Panzer Groups began to encircle Minsk, and by the time they had surrounded the city, 417,000 Red Soldiers were still trapped in the pocket. Even still, encircling such a large force was a difficult task for the Germans, leaving many large gaps which allowed about 250,000 soldiers to escape. Hitler ordered the panzers to halt and wait for the infantry, granting the Soviets valuable time to turn their shattered army in Minsk into an organized force. Another problem the Germans faced was that commanders like Heinz Guderian tended to interpret orders more as suggestions, and in some cases totally ignored unwelcome orders. By July 2nd, the pocket had been closed, and the 417,000 men still in it, either dead, missing, or captured. Colonel General Mikhail Kirpanos was in charge of the Southwestern Front, and although a capable divisional commander, he was somewhat out of his depth commanding an entire front. By the 26th of June, General Paul von Kleist's 1st Panzer Group had crossed the Steyr River, captured Lutsk, and was in position to attack Kiev, the Ukrainian capital. Kirpanos was able to assemble three new mechanized corps, the 8th, 9th, and 19th. Konstantin Rokossovsky's 9th, although armed with outdated T-26s and BT light tanks, managed to savage the 13th Panzer Division as it approached Rovno on the 27th. The 8th and 15th the previous day had given the Germans a bloody nose but were forced to withdraw east two days later. For the first time in the war, the Germans met the wrath of concentrated Soviet fire. Meanwhile, something more sinister was occurring behind the front lines. Nazi ideology, which viewed Jews and Slavs as subhuman, was being enacted by both Wehrmacht and SS units. Civilians were often shot out of hand to deter any future resistance, and Jews were rounded up and executed. Soviet political commissars, in accordance with the Commissar Order, were segregated from other POWs and executed, with almost every unit in the German army following the order. According to Glantz, 3 million Russians, Belarusians, and Ukrainians were made into slave laborers. Operation Barbarossa kicked the Holocaust into full swing, and the atrocities would continue, getting even worse as time went on. By July 3rd, the Nazis had destroyed the three field armies on the Western Front and mauled both the Northwestern and Southwestern Fronts. German forces were standing by the Western Davina and Dnieper rivers. Although they were confident in victory, the fresh flow of Soviet troops on the river's eastern banks, defending and counter-attacking, shocked them. These forces were often hastily thrown together, lacking tanks, weapons and effective communications, but ultimately the Germans were unaware of their existence until they bumped into them in battle. The Germans continued their exploitation, and Timoshenko organized an offensive on the 13th. 
Timoshenko's forces west of Smolensk advanced towards Bobruisk and despite poor coordination and green troops was able to push 80 kilometers before being halted by the German 2nd Army's 53rd Corps. By the 20th however, the Germans were able to reverse their gains. Rokossovsky, now reassigned to the Western Front, assembled a force comprising the 38th Rifle and 101st Tank Divisions and halted 7th Panzer Division from the 18th to the 23rd before joining the general counteroffensive on the 24th. Another important event occurred in late June and through July. Soviet General Yakov Kreiser, only 36 years of age, halted Guderian's tanks near the Borisov region. Despite having less men, tanks and air support, Kreiser dealt a significant blow to Guderian, who was considered the world's best armoured commander. The overwhelming German manpower meant that Chrysler could not hold out for long and began a fighting retreat eastwards. His efforts allowed the Soviets to bring forces to reinforce the Dnieper River. For his and his unit's actions, Chrysler would be awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union and his division, the 1st Moscow Motorized Rifle Division, would be bestowed the title of being a Guards Division. Guderian and Hermann Hoth had failed to close the Smolensk pocket entirely, allowing roughly 20,000 Red soldiers to escape east. Despite the encirclement, the German forces defending the encirclement suffered the effects of attrition. For example, the 18th Panzer Division had 12 working tanks by the 23rd, and Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group fell from 953 tanks at the start of Barbarossa to 286 on the 29th of July. The encircled units at Smolensk, unlike previous encirclements, were far more organized and maintained their chain of command, enabling them to resist for over a week. Other attacks occurred from the 23rd against Army Group Center's overextended Panzer and Motorized Divisions east of Smolensk. These attacks were the first genuine counter-offensive of the war, aiming to relieve Pavel Korochkin's three encircled armies and capture Smolensk. It failed, owing to poor coordination, a lack of logistical support and weak fire support, but nevertheless inflicted significant German casualties. The Red Army underwent significant reorganization from the 15th of July. Stavka Directive No. 1 made field armies smaller and abolished rifle and mechanized corps. The size of rifle divisions shrunk, as well as their allocations of artillery and trucks, dropping 24 and 64 percent respectively. Tactical air unit regiments shrunk from 60 to 30 aircraft. These lessons the Red Army learnt, although coming at a heavy cost, enabled them to cling on during Barbarossa. However, that same month, Stalin began to exercise more control over the Red Army. Defeats were analysed in the most simplistic terms, accusing commanders of a lack of resolve or cowardice. Political commissars once again gained equal status to military commanders on the 16th. The renewal of party influence over the army was the work of Lev Meklis, one of the key figures behind the Red Army purges, and was intensely disliked by Zhukov and other career officers. Another Stavka order on July 28th created integrated anti-tank regions along the likely paths of German mechanized advance. However, the inexperience of many officers, who tended to maneuver their units like rigid blocks, still plagued the Red Army and led to significant casualties. One of the largest feats the Soviet Union undertook during Barbarossa was the forced relocation of industry to avoid capture. Under Stalin's economic plans in the 1930s, the Soviet administration did not consider a major invasion of the country, thus it built most of its industrial capacity in the West. From the 24th of June 1941, the State Defense Committee set up the Council of Evacuation, tasked with moving factories and workers east of the Urals and even into Siberia. Headed by Lazar Kaganovich initially, before his replacement by Nikolai Shvernik in July, had an extremely difficult and laborious task. Raw materials had to be assembled, factories had to be relocated along with its workers, and electric plants were scheduled to remain operating just long enough before being quickly dismantled and relocated. For example, it took 8,000 railcars to transport just a single major metallurgy plant. According to Soviet accounts, which are likely inflated, 1,910 large factories, including 824 armaments factories, were transferred from July to December, requiring 30,000 trains with 1.5 million railcars. The Soviets could afford the inevitable decline in output due to the relocation in the meantime, since they had adequate existing stocks of armaments and the factories still in operation could continue to produce. For example, in 1941, Soviet industry produced 6,590 tanks, while Germany produced 5,200. And that is factoring in the seizure of Soviet industry during Barbarossa. Whether an exaggeration or not, the industrial relocation by the Soviet state was a testament to their organizational capabilities and was crucial in the nation's struggle against Nazi Germany. That which the Soviets could not relocate, they also would not let the Germans control. 
Most of Stalin's scorchers policy focused on destroying transport and electricity infrastructure. Locomotive repair shops were sabotaged and hydroelectric dams such as the one on the Dnieper River were breached. The Germans were shocked by this as they intended on relying on the newly captured Soviet territory for resources to prolong the war effort and achieve their long-term ideological goals. The Soviet railroad network had different gauges to Germany's and the problem that afflicted the Russian Empire during its westward offensive in 1914 now bit the Germans' backside. All of these factors consumed time and material, causing a significant drain on what was becoming an increasingly strained German economy. However, this did not stop the Nazis from seizing much of the Soviet's industrial plant and harvest, which in the immediate present satisfied their needs. For about 12 months following the fall of France, it seemed like the British and its empire were holding up the war effort single-handedly. Roosevelt, going against the wishes of the American populace by and large, began lending limited material aid to the British in 1940, and codified its support by signing the Lend-Lease Act in March 1941. Two days after Barbarossa began, Roosevelt is quoted as saying, We are going to give all the aid we can to Russia, marking a watershed moment in US involvement in the European war. Unlike the majority of the population, Roosevelt and his cabinet foresaw that US involvement in the war was inevitable, and Harold Ickes, Secretary of the Interior, wrote to Roosevelt on June 23rd, stating the pragmatic need to back those fighting the Axis, quote, It may be difficult to get into this war the right way, but if we do not do it now, we will be, when our turn comes, without an ally anywhere in the world. Aid to the Soviets was more controversial than aid to the British, so Roosevelt had to maneuver in such a way that there was no political backlash. The Treasury Department first unfroze $39 million worth of Soviet assets, and the White House stated that the Neutrality Act did not apply to the German-Soviet War, which enabled American ships to dock at Soviet ports. Even still, the Americans had their reservations on the success of the Soviet resistance, but any doubts or fears were allayed after Harry Hopkins, one of Roosevelt's closest confidants, met with Stalin in late July. Stalin exuded great confidence according to Hopkins and assured him that if Soviet requests for weapons were met that they could hold on until the winter. Although there was some evidence to justify the Soviet dictator's confidence, there still remained a desperate inner fear of failure. After meeting with Hopkins, Stalin asked him to extend a personal message to Roosevelt, urging him to join the war against Germany, even offering for American troops to be stationed anywhere on the Soviet front under autonomous American command. The British landed significant aid in the short term, and by the end of 1941, had provided 699 aircraft, 466 tanks, 867 vehicles, and 76,000 tons of other supplies. A joint Anglo-Soviet force would also invade Iran in late August. Much has been said about Lend-Lease and the commitment of the Western allies to the Soviet effort, with some overstating Western contributions and others downplaying or outright ignoring it. But it is clear that they weren't willing to abandon the Soviets, their ally, and at this stage in the war were doing whatever they possibly could to help. Much to Hitler's displeasure, despite the utter destruction of several Soviet armies, the Red Army had not collapsed. On the contrary, it was becoming more organized, more proficient, and deadlier, inflicting startling casualties on the invading Germans. Their experiences in the Polish, French, and Yugoslav campaigns taught the Germans that encircled formations would give up very easily. Soviet troops, on the other hand, did not, often fighting with suicidal fortitude, lasting until they had fired their last round, and even then, continuing to fight on with whatever they could. At the end of July and during the beginning of August, the cracks in the German Blitzkrieg had begun to show, both metaphorically and literally with the gaps between the German army groups, forcing a halt on July 30th so Army Group Center, making up 60% of German forces in the east, could resupply. Partisans and other encircled formations continued to chip away at the German ranks, and by the 2nd of August, the Germans had suffered 179,500 casualties, but only received 47,000 replacements. The effects of attrition were starting to show. Franz Halder, Army Chief of Staff, wrote the following day in his diary on August 11th, The whole situation makes it increasingly plain that we have underestimated the Russian Colossus. Soviet divisions are not armed and equipped according to our standards, and their tactical leadership is often poor. But there they are, and if we smash a dozen of them, the Russians simply put up another dozen. They are near their own resources while we are moving farther and farther away from ours, and so our troops, sprawled over an immense front line, without any depth, are subjected to the incessant attacks of the enemy. The Soviets attempted to retake Smolensk and relieve the encircled Soviet troops in the city, but failed. 
Guderian's panzers attacked south across the Sojj River on August 8th, with Maximilian von Weichs' 2nd Army joining the attack on the 12th towards Gommel. Gommel was captured on the 21st, with the Soviets losing one-third of the defenders. Recognizing the threat this advance posed, Moscow formed the Bryansk Front, commanded by General Eremenko on the 16th, himself considered the Soviet Guderian. Army Group Center was on the defensive, and Timoshenko, Zhukov, and Eremenko's forces clashed against the German forces at Dukovshina and Elnia. Timoshenko and Zhukov were the most successful, ravaging the German 9th Army's 5th and 8th Corps. Ivan Konov's 19th Army from the 17th to the 24th overwhelmed the 5th Corps. Timoshenko's offensive had faltered by late August before being renewed again on September 1st by Rokossovsky's 16th Army. Rokossovsky's assault inflicted heavy casualties on the German 28th Infantry and 14th Motorized Divisions, but failed once again when Soviets met heavy anti-tank defenses. Zhukov's attack had to stop by the 20th owing to heavy casualties, and failed to retake Roslavl. Eremenko's front had the impossible task to close the Starodub Gap in order to block Guderian's path to Kiev. 2nd Panzer Group, with the 2nd Army, broke through the Bryansk front from the 25th to the 28th, creating an irreparable gap. Further south, the 1st Panzer Group attacked across the Dnieper to form the southern pincer at Kiev. The Soviets launched vicious counterattacks against the Germans, and this, combined with inadequate supplies and poor infrastructure, forced the spearheads to halt. Aramenko tried on the first but failed immediately, as the 47th Motorized Corps parried Soviet attacks with ease. The new battle situation presented Guderian with an opportunity to encircle the Soviets at Kiev, the Ukrainian capital, and destroy the entire southwestern front. Zhukov understood that the Soviet forces at Kiev were in no position to defend it, and should have been withdrawn behind the Dnieper River. Enraged at the proposition of losing the city, Stalin accused Zhukov of talking rubbish, to which he replied, quote, If you think the chief of the general staff talks nonsense, then I request you relieve me of my post and send me to the front. Stalin did just that, demoting him to command the reserve front. Although Stalin may have enjoyed the small victory against one of his best generals, the defenders at Kiev were doomed to be encircled. By September 4th, Guderian's plan to envelop Kiev in two encirclements was halfway complete. Kirpanos, now subordinate to Marshal Semyon Budyonny as commander of the Western Front, requested withdrawal from Kiev but was refused. On September 12th, Kleist's 1st Panzer Group cut north and completed the encirclement of Kiev. On the 15th, Timoshenko was appointed commander of the Southwestern Front and sent a staff officer to give Kirpanos oral instructions to withdraw. Kirpanos wanted confirmation directly from Moscow, fearing he would be punished by Stalin if he was not 100% sure the order was legitimate. That confirmation only came on the 18th, but it was far too late. The defenders of Kiev put up a savage resistance, and some key leaders, such as Timoshenko and later to be Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, escaped with roughly 15,000 soldiers. Kirpanos was killed by a landmine whilst leading his forces out of the encirclement, making him the highest ranking officer to die in direct combat in the war. By the 22nd, the Kiev pocket had been liquidated, with the Germans suffering roughly 61,000 casualties. German reports state that they captured 665,000 prisoners, which according to David Glantz is likely three times the number of actual captives. Regardless of this, the Soviet defeat at Kiev was nothing short of a disaster, and was Germany's single greatest encirclement during Operation Barbarossa. Kiev was captured largely intact, unlike other cities and towns under Stalin's scorched earth. While the Germans set about occupying key buildings in the city, they did so blissfully unaware that the NKVD had booby-trapped much of the city, tying explosives to either time-delayed fuses or remote detonation. Some explosives had been defused already, but the Germans had no idea of what was to come. The first explosion occurred on the 20th, and on the 24th, another major one at a German ammo dump near the main post office. Another series of explosions at an administrative center and several hotels rocked the city, creating massive fires that spread wildly. The biggest victims of these bombings, however, was not the Germans or Ukrainian civilians caught in the explosions, but the Jews of Kiev, who were blamed for the destruction. Kiev's Jews were marshaled to an assembly point at the corners of Melnikovskaya and Dukturovskaya streets, before being marched to a nearby ravine called Babi Yar, where 33,771 of them were slaughtered in cold blood. Army Group South advanced south and east to exploit the victory at Kiev, occupying most of the northern Donetsk industrial basin. Kharkov was captured by the 6th Army on the 25th. Romania had been part of the Axis since November 1940 and was part of Operation Barbarossa, invading across the border and taking Bessarabia and northern Bukovina. Head of State Ion Antonescu had pledged the largest non-German force to take part in the invasion, fielding 686,258 men in the Romanian 3rd and 4th Armies. 
On August 3rd, they launched a large-scale attack to seize the port city of Odessa with six times the manpower and five times the artillery of the defenders. The battle, however, soon turned into a siege, owing to their donkey-brained approach to taking the city, which involved simply throwing soldiers at the enemy until they couldn't withstand it, leading to very high casualties. Hitler commented on Antonescu's tactics as follows, quote, Antonescu is using in front of Odessa the tactics of the First World War. Every day he advances a few kilometers after using his artillery to pulverize the space he wishes to occupy. The Romanians marched into the Soviet Union with obsolete weapons and ox-drawn carts, and their tactics were reflections of not just their outdated military doctrine, but also their outdated worldview. Within two months, the Romanian 4th Army suffered 98,160 casualties, roughly 30% of their original strength. A third major offensive was launched between the 9th and 20th of September, forcing the Soviets back, but once again at an extreme cost. Amphibious landings and a land counterattack forced the Romanians back on the 22nd, and positional warfare lasted until October 16th, when the Soviet garrison was finally evacuated. Romanian blood spilt by the Soviets paled in comparison, however, to the blood spilt by 250,000 Bessarabian Jews and 12,000 Roma that were genocided once Romania took control of that territory. In the north, the attack on Leningrad had begun on June 25th, when the Finnish army pushed the Soviet 23rd Army to its 1939 borders, effectively cutting it off from the north and only launching limited attacks towards the city. The Finns, in fact, began a partial demobilization after recovering their lost territory. On August 12th, near Starai Rusa, the armies of the Northwestern Front commanded by Major General Pyotr Sabenikov and Chief of Staff Major General Nikolai Vatutin attacked the German 16th Army. While unsuccessful, this attack delayed the Germans for 10 days, before von Manstein's 56 motorized corps outflanked Vatanen and resumed the offensive. Despite Zhukov being dispatched to the city, the Germans reached the city of Schlisselberg on the south shore of Lake Ladoga on September 8th, cutting off Leningrad from the south. The encirclement of the city was thus complete, and Führer Directive No. 35 ordered it to be shelled and bombed into submission. Luftwaffe raids on the 10th destroyed the city's creamery and tons of butter, and more bombs dropped on the 12th destroyed the city's main grain warehouse, beginning several long years of starvation, pain, and suffering that would last until Leningrad's liberation in January 1944. From mid-September, the Nazis began planning for the assault on Moscow as part of Operation Typhoon. The 2nd, 3rd and 4th Panzer groups assembled in the centre of the front, but this assembly took time owing to the effects of attrition and logistical hurdles, as the Nazis pushed deeper into Soviet territory in excess of 800 kilometres. Hitler transferred 306 tanks, including 60 Czech 38Ts, 150 Panzer III's and 96 Panzer IVs in mid-September in preparation for the operation. 4th Panzer Group was also given command of 2nd and 5th Panzer Divisions, which were almost at full strength since they had been resting and refitting since the Balkan Campaign. Between the 20th and 25th, British intelligence, having previously cracked the Enigma Code in the East, sent warnings to Stalin about German preparations for an attack on Moscow. The defenders had their own problems, largely with command and control. Ivan Konev was appointed commander of the Western Front, which prompted a change in commanders across his front. Konev had also reported German preparations as early as the 20th, but the Stavka had not issued a general alert until the 27th. Despite his best efforts, Konev's forces were not strong enough to defend his front line in depth, consisting of either worn down existing formations or new formations made up of poorly trained and equipped troops. The German hammer dropped on October the 2nd, marked by artillery and smoke screens across Konev's western and Bujoni's reserve front, and Luftwaffe planes knocked out Konev's headquarters temporarily. Although most troops held their fronts, the 4th Panzer Group penetrated the defences between the Reserve and Bryansk fronts, and the 3rd Panzer Group northwest of Vyazma. The two spearheads linked up on the 8th. The Soviets launched a counterattack across Konev's front, but it failed, and the Stavka belatedly issued the order to withdraw. However, communication issues between Budjoni, Konev, and Konev's deputy, Lieutenant General Ivan Bolden, led to most of the 19th, 20th, 24th, and 32nd armies being encircled west of Vyazma. Lieutenant General Mikhail Lukin, commander of the 19th Army, now commanded the encircled forces. The Germans would have greater trouble closing the Vyazma pocket owing to repeated escape attempts, including two rifle divisions that escaped on the night of the 12th. Further south, Eremenko's Bryansk front had been breached and the Germans had reached the city of Orel on the 3rd, and the German 2nd Army pushed in such a way to trap the 13th and 50th Soviet armies in two pockets. This encirclement was again poorly defended, owing to the enthusiasm of German commanders who wanted to push eastward, enabling elements of the encircled Red Forces to escape. 
Hitler had authorized German commanders such as Guderian to advance as far as their fuel would allow, but the foreboding signs of winter and the rainy Rasputitsa turned the roads into muck, and the Germans were wasting precious time and resources trying to dig their vehicles out of it. As the German hammer fell on the 2nd, the Soviet counterblows began on the 6th. General Dmitry Lelyoshenko's 1st Guards Rifle Corps blocked the 24th Motorized Corps of the 2nd Panzer Army near Matsensk. Colonel Mikhail Katukov's 4th Tank Brigade, equipped with T-34 tanks and cunning ingenuity, hid in the woods, allowing the Germans to roll past. Both commanders worked in unison, with Lelyoshenko's airborne infantry blocking the 4th Panzer Division from the front and Katukov unleashing his armored ambush from the flanks. The Germans tried desperately to escape, but controlled Soviet counterattacks halted them. Although the 4th Panzer Group suffered limited losses, the Soviets employed tactics shocked the 2nd Panzer Army, prompting them to conduct a special investigation into the ambush, with Guderian even saying that his opponents were learning. Zhukov was appointed commander of the Western Front by Stalin, and he desperately requested Kono be his deputy for the sake of continuity. The Soviets achieved temporary relief owing to Lelyashenko's counterattacks and Lukin's struggle in the Vyazma pocket, which enabled them to establish a tenuous defense. Even still, the 3rd Panzer Group was able to take Kalinin and the 9th Army reached Kaluga, forcing Zhukov to fall back several kilometers. In response, Stalin panicked and ordered the evacuation of most of the Communist Party, Stavka and civil government officers to Kuybyshev, which sent panic through the streets of Moscow. People mobbed trains attempting to escape, believing the Germans were about to occupy the city. A radio announcement that Stalin remained in the city calmed people down. The German offensive chugged along towards the gates of Moscow, committing their last reserves in their final thrust. In contrast, the Soviets still had plenty of forces ready for a counter-offensive. Roughly one-third of German motor vehicles were operational, and most divisions were at either one-third or half their original strength. Although advances towards Moscow, Rostov and Stalingrad may have been successful, it would have put further strain on the German army's already precarious logistical predicament and manpower situation. Gerd von Rundstedt, commander of Army Group South, requested to halt his attacks on the 4th and rebuild his forces in preparation for 1942. On the 13th of November, staff officers of the OKH met at a conference in Orsha to discuss how far they should advance, which convinced Franz Halder that the Wehrmacht were only really capable of threatening Moscow and besieging Leningrad that year. The battle situation for the German army called for a double envelopment of the Western Front and Moscow, with the 3rd and 4th Panzer Groups continuing towards Moscow from the north and the 2nd Panzer Army from the southwest. Zhukov, acting on intelligence from the Western Front's analysts, begged Stalin to approve stalling attacks. Meanwhile, other front commanders such as Pavel Belov launched an attack with his cavalry group against Guderian's right flank, catching the 112th Infantry Division by surprise and sending most of them into a retreat. When the ground froze over by the 15th, Bok's Army Group Center resumed the offensive. Bok's forces comprised 300,000 men and 900 tanks, while Zhukov had 240,000 men, 1,254 guns and mortars, 502 tanks and roughly 180 combat aircraft. Zhukov also had 169,369 troops in reserve, which made the two sides roughly equal. The Germans attacked the highway running from Kalinin to Klin to Moscow, pushing forward against a fierce defense. By the 24th, the 3rd Panzer Group captured Klint. The Soviet defense slowly gave way to the German attacks, but a combination of low temperatures and issues with fuel, ammo and maintenance forced the offensive to a halt. But the German battle failures and weather were the only explanations for their struggles. The Soviets, although still consisting of inexperienced troops, now had multiple rifle divisions in 2nd Echelon and cavalry in reserve. Moscow's workers had dug belts of trenches and anti-tank ditches, allowing the typical rifle army to defend a much shorter front and occupied to a depth of 50 kilometers. Counterattacks by Belov's Cavalry Corps now designated the 1st Guards Cavalry Corps, supported by half of the 112th Tank Division, combat engineers and Katusha rocket launchers, smashed against Guderian's panzers 80 kilometers northeast of Tula on the 27th, penetrating virtually undetected and relieving pressure around the city. From the 14th of November to the 5th of December, the German offensive began to halt across the entire front line. The final German effort on the 1st by the 4th Army along the Minsk-Moscow Highway near Nara for Minsk ran into a comprehensive Soviet anti-tank defense, and counterattacks by General Mikhail Efremov's 33rd Army halted by the 5th. Although the Germans had reached the outskirts of Moscow, with some officers reporting that they could see the Kremlin spires, these represented only the further spearheads of the Nazi advance. The Germans had some success much further south, capturing Rostov on November 20th and attempting to capture the nearest oil field in the Caucasus, but failed. Thus, by December 5th, Operation Barbarossa, the largest military operation in history, had come to a halt, culminating perilously close to Moscow, 
but with the city ultimately slipping out of the Nazis' grasp. With the German offensive halted at Moscow's metaphorical gates, the German army, although still operational, was in a dire state. Their spearheads were strung out and the Luftwaffe were operating from improvised airfields, and the cold weather meant that engines had to heat for hours so they wouldn't freeze up in the cold. The Soviets, on the other hand, had heated hangars for their aircraft. Casualties on both sides by December 5th were astronomical, with the Soviets suffering roughly 5 million casualties while other Axis forces suffered in excess of 1 million. The Red Army, too, was in rough shape, with most units existing as skeletal formations, such as the 108th Tank Division, which only had 15 of the 217 tanks that were authorized. The Soviets were planning a counter-offensive across Army Group Center's front to drive the invaders away from Moscow, having just barely enough forces to do so. 1.1 million Soviet troops faced up against 1,708,000 Germans as of December 6th, and similar force ratios existed across artillery, tanks, and aircraft. While Barbarossa itself was over by the 5th, the Battle of Moscow would rage until early January the following year. The overextended German lines, in spite of their numerical superiority, allowed the Soviets to achieve local force superiority, for example, a 2.5 to 1 manpower ratio north of Moscow. From the 5th, the Soviets drove the German spearheads back, and their success emboldened their confidence, with the Stavka ordering missions across various fronts in the ensuing weeks. By the end of the Battle of Moscow in January 1942, the Soviet capital was no longer under any threat. The original goals for Operation Barbarossa, the destruction of the Red Army, the Communist government and Judeo-Bolshevism had failed miserably, but the German forces had achieved remarkable military successes in the six months the operation lasted. German early successes were a result of superior mobility, excellent communications and poor preparation on the part of the Soviets. In contrast to the Soviets, who moved their formations very rigidly, the Germans had excellent maneuverability in the early stages of the offensive, and the Soviets had paid little attention to defensive combat when developing their military doctrine. To put it simply, the reason for the early catastrophic Red Army defeats was that they were simply not ready to wage war in the summer of 1941, and Zhukov summarizes their predicament in his memoirs thusly. Two or three years would have given the Soviet people a brilliant army, perhaps the best in the world, but history allotted us too small a period of peace to get everything organized as it should have been. We began many things correctly, and there were many things we had no time to finish. Our miscalculation regarding the possible time of the fascist Germany's attack told greatly. The reasons for Soviet victory and German defeat during Barbarossa can be isolated to several key factors, including poor preparation, fascist infighting, logistical issues and attrition, and an underestimation of Soviet strength and willpower. Much of the German preparation ahead of Barbarossa was founded on preconceived notions influenced by National Socialist ideology. Hitler and the Nazis saw the Soviet Union as a rotten structure that would collapse at the slightest push, and believed that most Soviet citizens despised their Stalinist government. While many did despise communist governance, which is reflected in the hundreds of thousands of civilians who actively or passively collaborated with the Nazis, the Nazis underestimated the tendency of the Soviet people to unite against an external aggressor in the defense of the motherland. German military intelligence was also faulty. Despite close Soviet-German cooperation during the Weimar years, which included German officers being trained in secret in the Soviet Union to circumvent the Versailles Treaty, these officers were not systematically questioned on their experiences. Furthermore, the Nazis planned Barbarossa on the assumption that the Soviets had at most 150 divisions, when in reality, according to David Glantz, the Red Army had 821 divisions at its disposal. There was also a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of Soviet general staff and military high command, including its structure and who occupied important positions in it. The Germans also couldn't make their minds up about where the primary thrust of the offensive should fall, instead opting to attack three directions at once, to Leningrad, Moscow and Kiev, which according to some historians such as Sergei Mikhailov, left them with inadequate reserves. All of these factors, combined with a lack of knowledge of the scale of Soviet industry, worked to ensure the German planning for the offensive was based on fundamentally false or ignorant presuppositions, contributing to their eventual downfall. Another major factor explaining German failure was the lack of unity and even conflict between the major Axis armies that participated in Barbarossa. Military forces from Romania, Finland, Slovakia, Hungary and Italy fought alongside the Nazis, with varying force commitments. The Romanians, who made up the largest non-German force, were the only ones incorporated into the planning phase of Barbarossa. While they were all united in their anti-Bolshevik sentiments, there was particular conflict between the Romanians and Hungarians. Both nations had hotly disputed territory, and they each sought Germany's approval for their claims. 
As a result of these tensions, Hungarian and Romanian forces were prevented from serving next to one another. Antipathy between Hungarians and Slovakians also meant that the two needed to be separated with the buffer of German or Italian troops. Tensions between the Romanians and Hungarians were so high that according to David Stahill, the Hungarians mentioned at the end of 1941 summer that they would have rather been fighting the Romanians than the Soviets. This tension persuaded the Hungarians to withdraw their mobile corps in early September but were blocked by Hitler, provoking an argument between the Hungarian Chief of General Staff, Lieutenant General Ferenc Szambathalai, and Wehrmacht Chief Wilhelm Keitel. The Finns, who made up the second largest non-German force, were only really interested in claiming the territory they lost, pushing into East Karelia, which was never part of Finland, and partially demobilizing their troops after achieving this. The Finns' major commitment was their participation in the Siege of Leningrad, and failed attempts to take the Murmansk port. By the end of August, the Finnish leadership believed the Red Army had been underestimated and the Germans overestimated, and despite pressure from the Germans, refused to conduct any offensive action. Thus, the Germans had essentially lost their most powerful ally in the north. The Italians had committed some 62,000 men as part of the CSIR. Keitel described the Italians as a, quote, boundless disappointment, even though Mussolini claimed they were the best he could offer as a show of solidarity. Arriving in late August, the Italians had too few men to alter the fortunes of the Barbarossa campaign. While the Japanese did not have troops serving on the Eastern Front, their lack of a commitment to the German war effort exemplifies the lack of unity between Axis forces during Barbarossa and really underlines how fragile the Axis really was. The Germans, Italians and Japanese had been unified by their anti-Bolshevik beliefs since the 1930s and were codified in the Tripartite Pact signing in September 1940. The Japanese considered a coordinated strike against the Soviets from the Far East, but the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and Japan's defeats during the border conflicts at Kalkan Gol and Lake Kasan resulted in a reversal of opinion, with the Soviets and Japanese signing a non-aggression pact in April 1941. The lack of unity and infighting amongst Axis forces serving in Barbarossa and the broader alliance was yet another major factor contributing to Barbarossa's failure. Germany's logistical nightmare as Barbarossa unfolded was arguably the single most important factor contributing to their failure. The Nazis had come to power embracing the superiority of the motor vehicle over the railway, but as many as 1,600 trucks would be needed to equal the carrying capacity of a double-tracked railway line. Germany's natural resources consisted largely of coal and steel, essential for railways, whilst oil and rubber, essential for motor vehicles, had to be imported. Even before Barbarossa began, the mechanical failures from trucks prompted Army Chief of Staff Halder to engage in a demotorization program so they could replace their losses and standardize their equipment. Even before battle had begun in the east, the Nazi truck supply was dwindling, with mechanical failures outstripping the supply of new trucks or repairs of existing ones. Nazi victories in France, Poland and Yugoslavia gave them access to new war material that would be vital for Barbarossa, but this was a double-edged sword. The vehicles of the conquered armies were not the same as the existing German supply, obviously, which hindered standardization, and by the start of Barbarossa, according to David Stahill, the Germans had around 2,000 different types of vehicles, with Army Group Center needing to stock over a million types of spare parts. As previously mentioned in this video, the Germans also made extensive use of Czech tanks, primarily the 38T, to supplant German armored losses during the offensive. As Stahill puts it, quote, the evidence suggests that Hitler's Eastern Army resembled a pieced together mismatched construction, not the imposing, purpose-built, uniformly equipped war machine often portrayed in the immediate post-war literature. Motorization was concentrated largely within the panzer and motorized divisions, leaving regular infantry divisions more reliant on horse-drawn wagons, and also requiring more motor vehicle support for the burgeoning mechanized forces. The Germans had 600,000 motor vehicles heading into Barbarossa, and just as many horses. If the infantry were being left behind, the railroad troops were even worse off, suffering from low priority issuing of resources and being equipped with only 1,000 vehicles, mostly inferior French and British models across the entire front. Furthermore, just like in World War I, the Soviets had a wider railway gauge than the Germans, which meant all trains needed to be modified before they could travel on Soviet railways. They also expected the railways to be damaged in battle and sabotage, but the Germans had underestimated the extent to which this would occur, especially under a scorched earth policy, further compounding their problems. Oil shortages plagued the Nazi army in the east more so than in other campaigns, having to travel much further distances, and they couldn't rely on captured Soviet fuel dumps like they could in France, as Soviet fuel had a lower octane content and needed to be treated before being used. Georg Thomas, the chief of the war economy and armaments, requested the army focus on capturing the oil region of Drogobits in Galicia in a meeting with Halder on June 12th. 
which Holder refused, stating that, quote, political questions. I refuse to allow economic considerations to influence the operational direction. The USSR's poor road infrastructure, compounded by Stalin's scorched earth policy, further rubbed salt into the Germans' ever gaping wounds. The Germans' motorization supremacy doctrine would only be effective in areas with well developed modern road infrastructure, which the Soviet Union did not have. Instead, they were faced with barren plains with the occasional dirt road or farming tracks. The Soviet Union had 850,000 miles of road, of which only 40,000 were hard surfaced all weather roads. When the Rasputitsa arrived, many of these roads were turned into muck, and forcing German troops to spend valuable time dragging their vehicles out of it. By July 11th, 25% of their supply vehicles had permanently broken down, and panzer divisions were left without fuel, spare parts, and adequate ammunition. According to Stahill, the Nazis could only operationally sustain an advance of 500 kilometers, but by the end of the operation were 800 kilometers deep into the Soviet Union. The compounding of supply issues, logistical issues, and mechanical attrition was a significant cause of German defeat. The fourth major factor contributing to Barbarossa's demise was the underestimation of Soviet strength and willpower. Earlier I mentioned how the Germans severely underestimated the amount of divisions the Soviets could field, but they also underestimated the willpower and ferocity of Soviet soldiers in battle. In spite of the massive encirclements of Red Troops such as at Bialystok and Minsk, Soviet soldiers often engaged in guerrilla-style tactics against the invaders. Utilizing the dense Belarusian forests, Soviet soldiers would lay in wait for unsuspecting German patrols, sometimes even allowing them to come as close as 5 meters from them before beginning an unrelenting ambush. In other cases, Soviet soldiers often fought till they ran out of ammunition, saving their last cartridge to use on themselves rather than be captured. While these tactics and types of attacks did not outweigh the enormous casualties the Red Army sustained in the early stages, they inflicted considerable damage on the German army, not just physically, but mentally as well. Nowhere thus far in the war, including the Polish, Yugoslavian or French campaigns, had the German army met such a determined resistance, especially from a Slavic army that the Nazis considered to be racially inferior, and thus worse at fighting. As one officer in the 3rd Panzer Division reported, quote, during the first two days of combat, unarmored troops and rear echelon units suffered considerable losses inflicted by hostile enemy troops cut off from their main bodies. They hid beside the march routes, opened fire by surprise, and could only be defeated in intense hand-to-hand -hand combat. German troops had not previously experienced this type of war. On a larger scale, Soviet commanders very early on ordered crude and often suicidal counterattacks, which extracted a heavy toll on their troops, but nevertheless were effective at halting German soldiers, blunting the spearheads if only slightly and subjecting them to the ongoing effects of attrition. As the Germans progressed eastwards, the pockets of resistance forced them to dissipate their troops not only vertically as the front widened, but horizontally as well, taking momentum away from the lightning strike that their welfare doctrine was predicated on. The appearance of Soviet T-34 and KV-1 tanks came as a shock to the Germans, even though in the case of the latter model, it shouldn't have. German 37mm anti-tank shells pinged off the Soviet armor, and as one German observer noted, quote, The Russian tank rushed back to its unit by passing approximately 30 German tanks, which were dispersed throughout a large area. Several tanks, including mine, tried to destroy the enemy tank using a 37mm gun. These attempts, however, had no effect on the T-34, which we were observing for the first time. Fortunately for the Germans, these types of tanks only represented a fraction of the Red Army's tank force, which was filled primarily with obsolete T-26s and BT-7s, but nevertheless had an indelible psychological impact. While the Germans were able to capture millions of Soviet POWs, the fact they were capturing them in such large numbers and in such a short time meant that columns of POWs being escorted back to the rear were often poorly guarded. This allowed some to sneak off roads and tracks into the forest and link up with partisan bands to continue their struggle. Soviet resistance became more organized and stubborn as time went on, forcing the Germans to reassess their disparaging pre-war views of the Red Army and reluctantly acknowledge the frightening proficiency of their foe. I end with a quote from Franz Halder's diary entry on August 11th. Regarding the general situation, it stands out more and more clearly that we underestimated the Russian Colossus, which prepared itself consciously for war with the complete unscrupulousness that is typical of totalitarian states. This statement refers just as much to organizational as to economic strengths, to traffic management, above all to pure military potential. At the start of the war, we reckoned with 200 enemy divisions. Now we already count 360. These divisions are not armed and equipped in our sense, and tactically they are inadequately led in many ways, but they are there, and when we destroy a dozen of them, then the Russians put another dozen in their place. The time factor favors them. 
as they are near to their own centers of power while we are always moving further away from ours. And so our troops, sprawled over an immense front line without any depth, are subject to the incessant attacks of the enemy. These are sometimes successful because in these enormous spaces, far too many gaps must be left open. On June 22, 1941, the armies of Nazi Germany and her allies marched eastward into the Soviet Union as part of Operation Barbarossa, the largest military offensive in human history. The Soviet forces were caught completely by surprise, suffering horrific defeats and losing millions of men in the first few months. Slowly, however, Soviet resistance hardened, and the Germans found it harder to advance into the country as issues with logistics, weather, and infrastructure ground the Germans down. Soviet resilience and their ability to quickly learn and adapt to harsh lessons ultimately led to the German army being halted at Moscow, with most units at the end of their tether, and the start of three years of protracted, bloody attritional warfare, ultimately ending in Red Army troops taking over Berlin in May 1945. Thanks for watching.